In the previous episode, Cao Cao's near million strong army suffered a terrible defeat at the Battle of Red Cliff against the Sun Quan and Liu Bei alliance. With the balance of power shifting towards the alliance's side, they will soon drive away the rest of Cao Cao's army and expand their own domains. In this episode, we will look at the meteoric rise of Liu Bei's faction and the establishment of the Three Kingdoms. With Cao Cao gone, the scramble for the former domain of Liu Biao, Jingzhou, started. Zhou Yu, Sun Quan's commander, argued that he had the right of the first attempt to conquer Jingzhou bases occupied by Cao Cao's force. Zhuge Liang, Liu Bei's advisor, agreed, only to take advantage of Zhou Yu's defeat and the weakened Cao army to conquer the rest of Jingzhou. Tricked by Zhuge Liang, Zhou Yu's battle wound burst open out of frustration. This won't be the last time he gets trolled by Zhuge Liang. In the process of conquering Jingzhou, Liu Bei also recruited a few fresh faces. Among them was Huang Zhong, the geriatric general who will become a member of Su Han's Five Tiger Generals, and Wei Yan, who killed his previous master out of his personal sense of justice. Zhuge Liang, being a micromanager, didn't get along with the latter. With Jingzhou conquered, the Longzhong plan Zhuge Liang's blueprint for Liu Bei to defeat Cao Cao seemed to be progressing well. What he needed to do next was to conquer Liu Zhang's Yi territory and Zhang Lu's Hanzhong. However, Sun Quan's people really wanted Jingzhou too, because they had been trying to conquer it since its former lord Liu Biao killed Sun Quan's father, and they have spent a lot of resources in the project. Liu Bei, on the other hand, also needed Jingzhou because it provided the second route needed to attack Cao Cao and also because it is quite prosperous compared to the other less developed mountain provinces. Predictably, this piece of land will be the biggest bone of contention for the rocky Sun Liu alliance. Zhou Yu certainly tried his best to acquire Jingzhou, first by diplomacy, citing the massive favor Liu Bei owed them at the Battle of Red Cliff. But they just keep finding excuses to keep the territory. At first, they say that they are just the custodian of Liu Biao's son, Liu Qi, who was the legitimate owner of the province. Then, when he died, they promised to give it back after conquering the other territories, and so on, until eventually, Zhou Yu got fed up and plotted to assassinate Liu Bei. Since Liu Bei's wife recently died, Zhou Yu decided to lure him to their territory by promising the hand of Sun Quan's sister in marriage. It was all a ruse, of course, but Zhuge Liang used it to his advantage by broadcasting the news to everyone. Until it was too embarrassing for Sun Quan to carry out the assassination. Additionally, having Liu Bei's new bride along with him caused Zhou Yu's wound to burst open again. Obviously, Cao Cao wasn't oblivious to the fracture in his enemy's alliance. So he tried to add oil to the fire by borrowing the emperor's authority to make Zhou Yu and other Wu's officers the official administrators of the cities within Jingzhou. Zhou Yu, getting impatient with Liu Bei, decided to attack him. He tried to move his army to the territory by using the excuse that he would conquer Liu Zhang's territory for him so that he could move out of Jingzhou. Knowing that it was a trick, Zhuge Liang used this to his advantage again. He blocked Zhou Yu's army, and Liu Bei declared that he would never allow any harm to come to Liu Zhang, who was also a member of Liu's imperial family. So, not only that they have thwarted a covert invasion, they also gained Liu Zhang's trust, allowing them to move to the next stage of their plan, conquest of Yi province. Absolutely humiliated by this failure, Zhou Yu died out of frustration. Just to let you know, Poor Zhou Yu won't be the last person to be trolled to death by Zhuge Liang. Pang Tong, the fledgling phoenix, defected to Liu Bei around this time. Meanwhile, up north, Cao Cao finally executed Ma Teng, who was one of the collaborators of the Secret Belt Edict, a conspiracy that tried to bring down Cao Cao. Ma Cao, his son, then gathered Han Sui and other Qiang tribe members to attack Cao Cao. Despite his age, Cao Cao's running days wasn't over yet. The ferocious Ma Cao's assault caused him to run three times, making him disguise his appearance by cutting his beard and throwing away his red cloak. But alas, Ma Cao was defeated, and he would work under a few other lords before he would become a member of the Tiger Generals. The Western warlords haven't seen much action yet. That's because their lands were quite remote, 
and there were a lot of natural barriers, so they have pretty much kept their conflict in their own little bubble. Zhang Lu, the grandson of the Taoist leader Zhang Daoling, was pretty much running his own theocracy at Hanzhong. His main enemy wasn't Cao Cao, but Liu Zhang, the man who killed his mother. Liu Zhang was weak and incompetent. Even his own men didn't have much faith in him. So despite having a large territory, he preferred to seek external help against Zhang Lu from Cao Cao. His messenger Zhang Song, however, was treated poorly by Cao Cao, and the request failed. On his way back, he passed by Liu Bei's territory and was treated so well, he conspired to betray his own lord for Liu Bei. Liu Bei then moved to defend Liu Zhang from Zhang Lu, as per request but he vehemently refused to assassinate his host due to their familial connection. What caused the situation to change, however, was Sun Quan's actions. While he was away, Sun Quan had been plotting against Liu Bei as he fanned off Cao Cao's attacks and sending him running. He sent a fake letter to try to get his sister to return with Liu Bei's son as hostage. Luckily, the child was rescued in the nick of time. Then he tried to sabotage Liu Bei by spreading rumors against him to Liu Zhang. Liu Bei, who was fighting Zhang Lu at the time, was then deprived of supplies and an ambush was set up against him. He luckily survived, but Pang Tong was killed in his stead. Despite being caught from two sides by Liu Zhang and Zhang Lu, Liu Bei managed to defeat them both as Zhuge Liang backseat commanded him to victory. In the process of conquering Yi province, he recruited the ferocious Ma Chao, who managed to fight Zhang Fei toe to toe. Around this stage of the story, diplomacy is starting to be depicted to be as powerful a weapon as battlefield tactics. Cao Cao, who had conquered Zhang Lu's Hanzhong, was prevented from attacking Liu Bei's back when Zhuge Liang gave away a few cities in Jingzhou to have Sun Quan distract him by attacking Hefei. While all of this was happening, Cao Cao was mostly distracted by internal issues. He executed the Empress and replaced her with his own daughter, he got harassed by Taoist magicians, there were also rebellions and air selection. He had to deal with all of this while he was suffering from an annoying chronic migraine. But at least, he managed to promote himself to be the Prince of Wei, putting him only one rank below the Emperor. Liu Bei, who eventually conquered Hanzhong, also declared himself Prince of Hanzhong. This conquest had a lot of symbolic significance. Hanzhong was the first piece of land Liu Bang, the founder of the Han Dynasty, ruled. So he was basically modeling himself after his ancestor to reinforce his legitimacy. The Five Tiger Generals was also officially appointed at this time. Its members are Guan Yu, Zhang Fei, Zhao Yun, Ma Chao, and Huang Zhong. What? Huang Zhong? Why is that old coot a Tiger General? asked Guan Yu, who was around 60 years old himself. Guan Yu, who was renowned throughout the land by now, had become quite conceited in his old age. He had performed a lot of great deeds, but as they say, pride comes before the fall. Meanwhile, up north, Cao Cao's advisor, Sima Yi, whispered to his master a lethal plot. Not long after, Sun Quan received a request for collaboration to take Jingzhou. At first, he was undecided, so he tested the waters by offering Guan Yu a marriage alliance. How could a tiger's daughter marry the son of a dog? And with that undiplomatic response, Guan Yu became the catalyst for Wu Wei alliance and sealed his own fate. Despite his pride, Guan Yu suddenly lived up to his own fame. As per Zhuge Liang's advice, he went on the offensive and dealt a massive blow to the Cao army, killing important officers and seriously damaging their morale. When his arm was injured by an arrow, he endured an open surgery without anesthetics. Apparently, the more they fight him, the more his legend grew. Even Cao Cao was contemplating to move his capital in fear of his attack. Guan Yu was all gangster, until Sun Quan replaced his commander Lu Meng with a little nerd called Lu Xun. This man was a silent achiever, and nobody knew of his genius, especially Guan Yu. Playing on his lack of renown, he put Guan Yu at ease and created an opening for Lu Meng to launch a sneak attack and occupied Guan Yu's base. Cleverly, Lu Meng treated the population well and won their trust. And this is when Guan Yu's army started to crumble. Supply levels dropped and soldiers deserted in droves. In his dire strait, he asked for support from Liu Feng, Liu Bei's adopted son, but his request was refused. 
abandoned and defeated, he tried to go to his brother in the west. But alas, he was captured by Sun Quan's army. He was executed because he will not submit to another lord besides his brother. His famous horse, Red Hair, died a few days later because it refused to eat. What seemed to be a logical move for Sun Quan at the time turned out to be a massive blunder. Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei swore an oath of brotherhood to live and die as one. What he did pretty much earned Liu Bei's lifelong hatred and Guan Yu's afterlife hatred. In a folklore meets novel series of events, many supernatural incidents happened after Guan Yu's death. Liu Meng was possessed by Guan Yu's ghost and died mysteriously. Blood appeared from trees and so on. Sun Quan quickly submitted to Cao Cao and became his vassal to be protected from Liu Bei. Cao Cao accepted the submission, but he wanted no part in this shizer storm. When Sun Quan tried to pass the buck to Cao Cao by sending him Guan Yu's head, he cleverly gave Guan Yu an honorable funeral to escape Liu Bei's wrath. Sadly, before Cao Cao could witness what happens next, he soon followed his old friend and died of brain tumor. He was then succeeded by his son, the ambitious Cao Pi. The moment he came to power, he barely spared the life of his poet brother, his former rival to the throne. Then he made the emperor abdicate and established his own dynasty, Cao Wei. Wei, Wu, and Su were technically three different empires, because the rulers actually claimed to be emperors. However, it was commonly translated as kingdoms, so we will just go with that. With the last emperor of the Han dynasty deposed and killed, Liu Bei followed suit by establishing Su Han, claiming to be the rightful successor of the Han dynasty. And as emperor, his first decree was to launch a punitive campaign against Wu. What? This is a bad idea. Practically every minister was against it. He was putting personal affairs above his moral duty to defeat the usurper Cao Wei. This move was the beginning of a series of tragedies. Not even Zhuge Liang could stop his master now as the grieving Zhang Fei egged his brother to war. Ironically, Zhang Fei became the first casualty of this war before battle even started. He was killed by his own subordinates who was abused for working too slow in the preparation of the war. The fact that the culprit then defected to Wu just made it worse. For Liu Bei, this war had become deeply personal as he led the campaign himself and brought with him Guan Xing and Zhang Bao, the sons of Guan Yu and Zhang Fei. With a colossal army of 750,000, Liu Bei's horde seemed unstoppable until Huang Zhong was killed at Yiling then things started to go downhill. With Lu Xun once again put in command of the Wu army, he put up a strong defense as he bid for his time. As the Su army suffered from the seasonal heat, Liu Bei foolishly kept his army under the shades. Flammable shades. When Zhuge Liang received this news, it was already too late. Lu Xun attacked Liu Bei with fire and annihilated his army. Zhuge Liang could only launch a rescue mission to buy time and save his lord. Lu Xun, who was pursuing Liu Bei, was then trapped in Zhuge Liang's stone sentinel maze. By the time he got out, Lu Xun gave up on the pursuit and turned back. Because as he suspected, despite their submission to the treacherous Wei force, they attacked Wu instead of assisting them. Sun Quan's Wu eventually broke away from Wei and established their own dynasty. When Lady Sun heard that Liu Bei was killed in battle, she committed suicide. That was just a rumor, however. Liu Bei was actually still alive at the time, just barely, as he withered in Baidi, too sick to be moved. Haunted by the massive loss of life and the failure to avenge his brothers, he had lost his will to live. The dream to restore the Han dynasty and to punish the usurpers was then passed on to his loyal prime minister, Zhuge Liang. If my son is worthy, then support him, he asked. But if he turned out to be incompetent, then take the throne for yourself. With that said, Liu Bei went to see his brothers in the afterlife. Oh, by the way, don't trust Ma Su. He is full of hot air. Ah. What? Did he miss something? Zhuge Liang thought. Ah, forget it. Zhuge Liang actually had a much bigger problem to contend with right now. Five enemy army divisions are knocking on Su Han's door, all coordinated by the Wei mastermind, Sima Yi. The man who Zhuge Liang will eventually face in the battlefield and become his greatest arch rival. The next episode is Zhuge Liang versus Sima Yi. 
be sure to subscribe and like the video so that you don't miss it. If you like what we are doing, then you can support us on Patreon. Until next time, stay cool, my bros.